Welcome back. Um, this is the second part of uh, our discussion of the Aztecs and their co uh, and their cosmovision. Um, and in this one, we'll be we'll be talking really about the importance of sacrifice. Uh, we we finished up talking about Tlatelolcatl, the, the Earth Lady, uh, and how she gave birth to life, but also fed off it. And yeah, so this idea of sacrifice is something you really cannot get away from in the Aztec world. How can we understand it? Well, you might have come across already or read about uh, the inauguration of the Great Temple in the city of Tenochtitlan during the reign of Ahuitzotl. So he reigned uh, 1486 to 1502. Uh, and this temple was inaugurated after the rebellion of the Waxtecs. And according to the chronicles, Prisoners were lined up on all four sides of the pyramid and from dawn till dusk for four days and then they were sacrificed. Now if you take a look at this or the detail from this model uh, which is held by the Instituto Nacional de Arqueología e Historia um, you'll, you'll see that actually those chronicles couldn't have been accurate um, because there's only steps going up the front of the, of the dual temple. The, ju the dual temples of Tlaloc and we see Lepochli which combined to form the great the great temple of Tenochtitlan nevertheless what you do get a sense of is one of scale uh, the, the sacrifice however many were involved the sacrifices at the inauguration of the great temple were massive and some Scholars or chronicles have talked about approximately 20,000 people. Of course, numbers are very difficult to prove. But they're lined up from dawn till dusk for four days, one after the other, lining up and waiting for their hearts to be cut out. Now, it's a real conundrum, and we'll talk about that more um, in our seminar discussions. But even if massive spectacles like this happened rarely, because this really was massive and unprecedented in scale, Blood sacrifice itself is an everyday reality. Commonly, ordinary people would draw their own blood from their tongue, their ears, or their genitals using uh, maggie thorns, and they, and this would be a blood sacrifice for the gods. And bear in mind that not all rituals demanded human life. So quails were sometimes used as a substitute sacrifice uh, for humans. Now, over the years. Of course, a number of explanations for the massive scale of Aztec sacrifice have been put forward. And there's quite a persuasive, well, persuasive to us perhaps, but rather materialist idea that the re religion and cosmovision, and in particular the massification of sacrifice under the Aztecs, was a, in fact a cynical policy uh, to instigate and sustain the empire. And on the one hand, You've got scholars like Conrad and Demarest who highlight the rewriting of Aztec history under the, uh, I suppose, the the three key individuals that, that got it all going. This is this Itzcoatl, Tlacalel, and Moctezuma the first. And this is after they threw off the yoke of the Tepanek hegemony in 1428 AD that I mentioned in the, in the previous uh, video cast. So yeah, they threw off the Tepanecs and they rewrote Aztec history and established their own alliance between the three city-states. So Tenochtitlan, which was their own, Tlacuba or Tlacopan, and Texcoco, as I mentioned. This is known as the Triple Alliance, and as I mentioned earlier, it was this alliance that became known as the Aztec Empire. Now, part of the rewriting of history was the rewriting of the state cult and the demand of the patron deity, Huitzilopochtli, which is the sun god, for blood. And this drive for sacrificial victims, in turn, according to this, this hypothesis, necessitated continue, continued warfare, which brought in a flow of tribute and slaves. In other words, imperial wealth, that is, to the center of the empire, brought in tribute slaves uh, into Tenochtitlan. Now, Ross Hassig takes this argument further, and he suggests that the wars that were fought solely, sorry, the wars that were fought solely to take prisoners for sacrifice, known as flower wars, 
or flowery wars, where in fact they were strategic wars to grind down difficult opponents year after year until they capitulated because uh, they couldn't carry on fighting any longer, and they became tribute-paying members of the empire. So yeah, these these wars for sacrificial victims, according to Ross Hassig, they were strategic wars uh, that basically helped incorporate new territories into the empire. And these arguments actually work. They're logical, they're persuasive, they're based on the available evidence, and they successfully show the links between human sacrifice, political strategy, and imperial expansion, which of course includes significant wealth acquisition. There's also the uh, idea that uh, the massification of human sacrifice is, also, is to inti is intimidated uh, as yet not incorporated city states so they they'd invite the city the, the leaders of these city states to uh these huge sacrificial rituals they they'd watch and they would be terrified and then when the aztecs said right now you can be a part of us and pay our pay us tribute they would know exactly what would happen to them if they said no so yeah as i say these are very logical and persuasive arguments but there's something quite important missing from them what they don't help do is explain what daily sacrifice meant to the millions of people living in central mesoamerica and i say millions because before the spaniards got there mesoamerica was one of the most densely populated areas of the world uh, there have been estimated to roughly 15 to 20 million people living there in large city states so for them for these people and sacrifice and not just human sacrifice i'm talking about other ritual activities which involve votive offerings and bloodletting uh, it's not a cynical exercise in strategy or politics it's a daily nece and necessary activity so we should really ask them what does it mean where does it come from And to understand this, we need to go back to the creation myths. So, before the Earth existed, Tlaltecutli, the gargantuan toad or crocodile type creature, she floated in a watery space. And two gods, who you've come across, may have come across before, so there's Quetzalcoatl, or feathered serpent, and Tetzcatlipoca. They seized Tlaltecutli. And they tear it in two, they rip her in, into two pieces. One half of her body became the earth, and the other half the sky. Now, according to David Carrasco's rendition of the tale, other gods came down to console her, and they order that from her body, all the fruit and plants necessary for human existence will grow. So her hair becomes the trees, her plant that the, and becomes the plants and the grass. Her skin become, becomes flowers and herbs. Her eyes become springs, pools, and caves. Her mouth turns into rivers and large caverns. And the mountains and valleys were made from her nose. But this isn't enough for her, not surprisingly, because she's just been ripped apart and thrown up and down. And she continues to howl in the darkness. And I'll quote from Carrasco here because it's 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 an app. it's a, a, re, a really apt way of putting it. He says, this goddess cried sometimes in the night, desiring to eat the hearts of men, and she would not be silent unless she was irrigated with the blood of men. And that's why you see the blood trickling into her mouth. The production of life was intimately linked not only to death, but also to debts owed and debts paid. So, for example, if we take the staple food of the vast majority of indigenous peoples, which is maize, or maize corn, uh, if uh, you live in North America so and um, Canada in Mesoamerica maize becomes associated with death so the most productive maize fields are called Mikamili the maize field of death and it's expected that if your field is particularly productive one of the owner's families one of your family members would die as a result so even the very act of grinding up the corn in the morning, it's grinding up the flesh of the corn god and the, co and the corn goddess. And this requires rituals of 
appreciation to pay the debt that's owed to the gods and goddesses for the life that they give. But that debt would never be really paid until the person who lives by consuming the god and goddess is themselves consumed by Tlaltecutli. And you can add to that the creation story of the fifth sun, which is the current sun. So after the destruction of the fourth sun, the gods had gathered for the act of the creation of the fifth sun. But they knew that such an act would require them to sacrifice their lives. So remember, there's no birth without death. But they're afraid to do it. I mean, again, you don't blame them, really. I mean, if you think, oh, I've got to sacrifice my life to create a sun, you're going to hesitate, or you might hesitate at least. But one of the brothers... Uh, the crippled god Nanawatin, so it literally translates as he covered in pustules, he throws himself into the fire and he's consumed in the flames. But as you can probably guess, that's not the end because there's no death without rebirth this time. And Nanawatin, he emerges from the flames as Tonatiu, the, res the resplendent, the resplendent sun. So his brothers, meanwhile, uh, these are f what. Uh, fully formed uh, w warriors they're utterly shamed at being proven cowards by uh, somebody they consider disabled and they flung themselves onto the fire after him and they emerge as the moon and the stars anyway without all the value judgments attached to this once again the point is reinforced that there can be no life without death and that human life Mesoamerican and Aztec life or just all life, in fact, has only been made possible by the sacrifice of the gods. So the debt to be paid in human life is immense. Well, in reality, it's total. That debt can only be extinguished with the extinction of life and the end of the fifth sun. But in the meantime, the Aztecs had a responsibility to pay what they could and to nourish the gods. If and when the fifth sun ends, well, it will end because time is cyclical, uh, once the fifth sun ends, then it's up to the gods whether they decide to recreate uh, the universe again. But yeah, for now, the Aztecs had a responsibility to pay what they what they could in order to, I suppose, uh, cut into the interest of uh, that was accumulating on the debt. Anyway, overlaid with the creation myth, then you've also got an explanation of the sun's passage across the sky. So in its warrior aspect, Huitzilopochtli, so this is Tonatiu, but it's also Huitzilopochtli as a warrior. It fights its way across the sky, accompanied by warriors who've died in battle, and then it plunges into the underworld. Oh, sorry, warriors who've died in battle or been sacrificed. And then it plunges into the underworld. But it needs blood for the strength to emerge again from, from the underworld. So if the Aztecs don't provide enough human hearts, the fifth sun might come to an end. And that's a lot of responsibility to place on a people. Another one, Tlaloc, the rain god. He needs the blood and tears of children who are sacrificed in ceremonies, particularly designed to make both the children who are going to die and their families weep. Um, these children are selected from the Mexica population, in fact, they're not taken in war. Um, and in effect, it works as a form of sympathetic magic. So the more the children and the people cry, the more rain would be more rain would be granted to the fields. So the more uh, so the better the harvest would be. Another god, Sipe Totec, meanwhile, is the god of spring and the regeneration of life. Sounds like a nice chap. But if you translate it, his name, it means our flayed lord. Warriors would participate in ritual battles with warrior prisoners who would then be sacrificed and their skins would be flayed from their bodies. But that's not the end of it. Because the priests would become Sipetotec by wearing the flayed skins of the sacrificed victims. And you can see in this, these images of Sipe Totec, you can see how the skin has been turned inside out and there's kind of the bits of flesh hanging off from it. You can see the cuts in the skin where the heart, heart's been taken out and uh, where the, hand, the hands are, uh, are falling off. Anyway, yeah. So the priests become Sipe Totec. They wear the flayed skin as the sacrifice, sacrificial victims. And you might ask, well, why do they do this? 
Well, as an answer, think of one of the most important animals in the Aztec cosmovision. You see images of snakes everywhere. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. And the reason for this is that snakes are visual demonstrations of these cycles of life and death. As they grow, they hide in the earth, under the ground, in, in, in holes, and they sh or somewhere safe for them. And they shed their old skin, and they emerge stronger and bigger. The mother of Huitzilopochtli, Coatlicue, she wears a skirt of serpents. She's an aspect of the earth goddess. She's covered in a ne and, and this, this skirt of ser serpents is, is basically a network of reptiles. And Coatlicue feeds the sun and the moon and the humankind, collecting the bodies of the de dead as they die. And you can see that from, uh, and you can see that the, the, the out, so that the, her visage, her face, uh, is, a, is, a, is a skull, and also her claws are outstretched, ready to grab the bodies of the dead uh, in order to feed them to the sun and the moon. So with regard to Sipetotec, just like a snake sheds its old skin, the flayed skin of the sacrificial victims rots off the bodies of the priests, and they emerge like the snake rejuvenated and stronger. So the sacrifices to Sipetotec ensured that the same would be true of the Aztec people, and the sacrifices ensured that they would continue to live. And just as a, a kind of an aside, remember I said that uh, the Mexica people um, were driven into the middle of Lake Texcoco by the Acolwa hegemony, and they're based at Culhuacan after a significant misunderstanding. Well, that misunderstanding links to this uh, this ritual. According to legend, and you see this in the uh, kind of transliterated in, this, in, this, in the, the chronicles that were taken down by, uh, by the indigenous neophytes who were fluent in both Spanish and uh, Nahuatl. Anyway, they, they describe how the Mexica, who were allied to the Akolwa, they approached the Akolwa king and they asked for his daughter to be married to uh, their leader. And the Akolwa king is honoured uh, because the Mexica were fierce warriors, and this, he thought he thinks this will cement the alliance um, between the two the two peoples. And so he hands over his daughter to the Mexica, who promptly uh, bend her over an altar, take out her heart, and flay her. And then the Akolwa sees the Aztec priest, sorry, the Mexica priest, wearing the skin of his daughter. And as soon as he sees this, he realizes that, uh, well, he realizes the truth of what was asked. And uh, the Akolwas rise up and they slaughter as many of the Mexicas as they can and they drive them into the, into the lake. Now, again, we might ask, well, what on earth is going on here? Uh, it's not that the Mexica just wanted to kill the daughter. They, they asked for the daughter's hand or the da the daughter to be married to Witzilopochtli, Witzilopochtli, who is their patron deity, um, and also the sun god. Uh, yeah. So in order to do that, she had to be sacrificed. Um, anyway, so this is the ritual of the flayed skin. The priest was wearing the skin in order to uh, be reborn like the snake as the skin kind of dries and, 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 and drops off. Pretty gross to our modern sensibilities, but um, very, very important uh, for understanding the cycles of life and death. So yeah. How do we sum it up then? What you've got then is a society in which the gods were intimately connected with the people in the created world. The people who lived in that world have a tremendous responsibility and debt. It's a, the debt is total. And that responsibility is to sustain the gods who've sacrificed themselves in order to create life. 
But at the same time, there's always the recognition that the established order would come to an end and that what was created would be destroyed. This is a necessary part of creation itself. There's no order without chaos. There's no creation without destruction. There is no life without death. And that's where I'll leave it for the moment. Thank you very much.